It sucks when things don't work, when we spend weeks and months building a project only to be let down by a sneaky bug when it comes to the final UAT. But why does that nearly always seem to happen? And is there anything we can do about it? Well, if you're being bugged by bugs, keep listening because on today's podcast, we're going to discuss how we can get things done right with an improved product and process and the magic of a quality management plan. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ben Ashton, founder of the Digital Project Manager. Welcome to the DPM podcast. We're on a mission to help project managers succeed, to help people who manage projects deliver better. We're here to help you take your project game to the next level. Check out the digitalprojectmanager.com to learn about our training and resources we offer through membership. This podcast is brought to you by Clarison, the leader in enterprise project and portfolio management software. Visit clarison.com to learn more. Today, I'm joined by Michael Luchin, and Michael is one of our resident DPM experts. He's a product coach at Crema, and they are a digital product agency creating web and mobile apps for disruptive companies and industry leaders. And he works remotely, normally out of DC, and uh, he helps teams improve their collaboration to analyze and solve complex problems. And he's worked with Adidas, Callaway Golf, among others. And he's a coach at Crema. And uh, we're going to talk to him today about building a quality management plan. But hello, Michael, and welcome to the show. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. And I'm curious, as we've been talking and recording podcasts over, I guess, the years, your your role has evolved. And I'm interested in your coach role that you now have, uh, which is a new job title, I think. So can Mm -hmm. you tell us a bit about what is this coach? What is a product coach? And uh, what does that mean at Crema? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, like you mentioned, um, this is coming off of about seven years of hands-on project and, and product management experience. And um, really, quite frankly, the role is in, in definition right now. We're trying to figure out uh, what is a coach role at Crema. Um, right. Quite simply, right now, we're, we're approaching it as um, a servant leader of uh, helping clients um, understand agile uh, practicing. Um, to become better versions of themselves. Um, typically, I might serve as a facilitator, a product strategist, and a design thinker to help them reframe problems and identify innovative approaches. But I think right now, what's what's really interesting about this new role and this new venture for Crema is, is trying to trying to make a dent um, in a crowded industry um, by approaching it from a very unique angle of that's that's not prescriptive. Um, there's so much prescriptive coaching processes out there, right? Uh, and we want to be different. Okay, so your role in your role, you go with you know a small team uh, and work directly with a client, and that is that more of a strategic role than when you're trying to define the project or the the product kind of roadmap. Yeah, or is it, it more it, delivery it, focused? It's it's a little it's it's similar to to what you you just mentioned um, a little more broad and it's, it's more focused on the people um, and so um, one of my my things I love about project management is being able to focus really on cultivating a healthy environment for teams so that they can do their best work um, and so this is really kind of taking that um, and just um, helping give clients the tools um, and, and frame of mind that they need to create a healthy. Uh, productive culture and environment within their teams to create uh, really great results. And so what kind of challenges do you deal with in helping clients, I guess, change their delivery mindset? Yeah, I think it's it has to do, I mean, there's there's, there's a lot of challenges that can come up, um, um, but I think it's it has to do with that results are not always going to be instantaneous. Um, this isn't right. something that I can go in and, and, and say, you know, do this and things will be better. Um, there's certainly... Um, a lot of that out there, um, you know, learn X uh, framework and you will, your team will succeed. But I yeah. think what's important is to have the full context of the culture and the org at play and understanding that when you're empowering uh, leaders that you're working with, um, that it takes time to experiment and figure out how those lessons sit in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's so true that there's not a single process that you can follow uh, that's going to be absolutely right for your um organization 
or or agency and if you simply follow the steps you're going to suddenly get these magical results there isn't there isn't a magic there isn't a silver bullet that you can Mm -hmm. that you can use that's going to suddenly fix all your problems and i think sometimes people think oh well agile is the silver bullet and then we have to define okay well what does that mean so that sounds like a an interesting role that you are pursuing there and are you mainly doing that remote or do you do that on site with clients um, definitely a combination. Um, right now, as we're recording this, definitely 100% remote. But yeah. um, you know, I think it 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 it, it, it there's relationships um, can be built in person, and so if possible, it's always great to kick off coaching them. But um, I've found the ability to create uh, really productive and meaningful conversations over Zoom chats or um, using Loom screen shares to. Um, provide guidance or answer a question or collaborating in Miro boards. Um, and so it can be really done either way. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're talking about remote working. Obviously, we're in the middle of Corona quarantine. And you actually recently did a workshop for us on remote working. But for anyone who missed that, um, or maybe even now as you reflect on um life working remotely and how now everyone is sharing uh, forced to share your experience of remote working what do you for you what would be the most impactful hack or technique that you use uh to not go insane um when you're working by yourself when you're working remotely um how do you yeah how how do you kind of tackle that feeling of isolation and working remotely because I know normally you talked about how hey, you you know go to co-working spaces. But I'm sure you've got lots of experience of being holed up, um, maybe at your house. Um, what do you do to keep sane in that? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good and timely question. Um, so I think mentally, uh, I try to remember that I'm collaborating with and working with other human beings, and so Zoom uh, calls as much video Zoom calls as much as possible. Yeah. Um, has been incredibly valuable. Um, it sounds really simple in this time, especially when I saw Zoom is like the number one free most downloaded app right now. Um, but I yeah. think intentionally approaching that as a from a collaborative perspective, let's just hop on a Zoom call with my team and talk through things. You can see nonverbal interactions is so valuable, um, especially as a project manager. Um, and I, I even go so far as to make it a point to sometimes have a whole second screen if I'm sharing my screen um, to ha- just so I can see everyone's faces still. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's solid advice. And I think it's it's Zoom's a great tool and I think the temptation can be when we also have Slack to simply start, you know, typing things away in Slack and uh and we forget that actually we're missing out on a whole bunch of the communication uh and also that ability to build relationships as well. Like the conversation is different when when you have a Zoom chat. So um mm-hmm get dressed and uh, and have a zoom call yeah. to your hair and uh i think it, it definitely pays dividends so i mean you're talking about um coaching and you know you said that hey you're doing this remotely as well as in person obviously it's all remote now but can you tell us a bit about some of the projects uh you're working on now yeah so right now um I am uh transitioning fully from from product management uh over to the coach role so i'm wrapping up a large multi-year enterprise uh, development project right now. Um, and it's really cool to do this and approach it with a coaching mindset um, because there is definitely a lot of uh, overlap when you bring like coaching down into like the practitioner level. Um, otherwise, I'm right now I'm looking ahead to uh, really just build out like what are these coaching services um, and specifically what is that key differentiator on how Crema might um, make a difference in this and, and really serve um, clients with humble confidence. Yeah. And so as you're thinking about what challenges clients might be having that you're helping to address, um, what are what are some of those key delivery kind of snags that you are identifying as potential opportunities for you as you're kind of building out this role? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it it's it's an interesting I've got an interesting metaphor for that as far as what we're thinking um, is a kind of approaching coaching similar to a college curriculum a semester in a college curriculum um, and the reason for that is because um, I believe that so much about effective coaching is by experimentation by the people that I would be coaching to actually experiment and learn by themselves 
um, with basically my role really serving as a facilitator and a guide and a mentor uh, with with practitioner experience. Um, and so this involves like uh, regular cadence of having check-ins, uh, retrospectives, um, observations, and shared notes being, hey, you know, maybe you want to check this out or try this out in your next meeting, but really just creating a rhythm so that in a period of whether it's a few weeks or a few months, um, that by the end of it, we can all look back and say like, whoa, like, yeah, there is definitely marked improvement uh, from this. I feel that my team is able to produce more. And so as you're kind of identifying potential areas of an organization to think about becoming more agile, how do you help them prioritize those areas? Because obviously within a big organization, there's going to be lots of different process going on. Um, How do you help clients identify which aspects of their process or delivery are ripe or low hanging fruit for thinking about things in a more agile way? Yeah, I, I think it starts with a survey. Um, so just being able to have a conversation um, and maybe this, you know, the survey isn't just with one client contact. It may be with um, some, some project managers and developers and, you know, whoever else is involved uh, or wants to be involved in this process. Um, but it starts with a survey to figure out, like, what are kind of their uh, perceived notions of what is most important to resolve. Right. Um, and then some time uh, for my team and I to go back process and look at that survey, but also cross-reference it with what we kind of, the subtext of what we heard from them so that we can make recommendations that let's move forward in, you know, these top two or or three areas. These are the ones that are going to have some really great outcomes if we move forward um, with them now. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds pretty smart. Well, good luck with that. And uh, I want to get back to your post in this topic where we started of quality management. And if you haven't read the post that we're going to talk about yet, check it out on the digital project manager.com. It's called how to develop a quality management plan. And in it, Michael helpfully goes through a really thorough step-by-step process for creating the quality plan. And if guy, if you guys are members, you can also get access to the quality management plan, target device list, and requirements quality checklist template, so you can put all of this into action super easily. And we're not going to dig through the process of creating the plan too much here because that's in the post. Um, but in summary, Michael talks about how you can go about creating a quality pa- plan for your project or product. Um, but I just want to start with this idea of quality. Um, you start by uh, talking about in your process of creating this shared understanding of what quality means for your project. And I mean, why do you think that is so hard to get a grip on? Yeah, yeah. So, so first off, just to kind of set the, set the stage of like quality in this discussion, I, I see it as, as two things. It's like product quality and process quality. Um, mm. Product quality is, the, is like the quality of your actual like tangible or digital product. Um, it includes all the results of your design team's work, your, your developer team teams work and, uh, and more. Um, process quality is really as, as PMs, what we have a strong hand in that is the, that refers to the process that we cultivate, um, that then in turn impacts our team's ability to drive results. Um, an example metric we all might be familiar with is, um, velocity to help measure, um, how process quality is is going. That said, Giving a shared understanding of quality is hard to get a grip on for a lot of teams because of all the subjectivity and emotion that I think can go into it. Mm. Um, you've got so many different stakeholders, and this includes your own team as well of like developers and designers coming at it from different perspectives uh, for different reasons. Uh, for example, uh, you might have a client stakeholder that desires a certain level of quality that meets expectations, whereas a developer might um, really value code quality and uh, clean code and want to write the perfect code. And so yeah. you have to be able to help facilitate and, and strike that balance. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that balance. I mean, and, and for me, this is a bit of an innate conundrum with Agile. Um, we have like acceptance criteria um, for a user story that that defines, you know, the parameters of that uh story like this this is what the the story needs to do these are the acceptance criteria it has to do achieve these things in order to be thought of as done and then we also have definition of done where we're like okay everything and that applies as a blanket thing across uh, all the user stories um but when we're thinking about agile often we're thinking about okay we're, we're trying to deliver value we're trying to deliver iteratively 
Um, and so sometimes, for me at least, the the concept of quality can be at odds with this agile delivery approach where we're thinking about, okay, well, what's more important? Is it that that ticking off all those acceptance criteria and definition of done or is it delivering value or is it both and just we have to go slower as a result yeah no that is a really good question um and uh i i love this question because i think this gets at like the root of why i love um diving into things like this so much um so I, I believe that a focus on quality is not at odds with agile i think it actually is an accelerant uh, to teams and an enabler to teams um, that are focused on agile uh, practices. Um, and the reason for that is because um, if you sit down at the beginning of a, of a project with your team and you define what quality means and what it shouldn't mean, that that helps put some healthy kind of uh, focus blinders on your team as you're like actually building the, and, and delivering the work. Um, it clearly states what should and shouldn't be considered. Um, and then as far as like even practical um, getting into the, the weeds of delivery and day-to-day work um, along the lines of things like acceptance criteria, um, those also serve as a tool um, to um, help support Agile if, if you're looking at it in the right perspective. And what I mean yeah. by that is, um, say, as an example, your team is working on a user story in a sprint and um, it already has acceptance criteria ex- associated with it. Um, but as your develop your developers are building it out. They run into maybe like a roadblock or something that they're able to get around uh, a specific technical challenge, which then in turn changes a piece of the acceptance criteria. That opens up an awesome discussion. It doesn't mean we have to slow down and go the old way. We can pause as a team, have a quick discussion, update the acceptance criteria, and the acceptance criteria exists to serve quality um, in that example. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's about changing, I guess, the mindset of quality uh, rather than quality being uh, something that is at odds uh, with um, rapidly delivering value. It's actually, well, thinking about quality is a, an important component of value. And if we're delivering something of value, then it needs to have the, it, unless it hits that kind of quality criteria that we've set, Maybe it's not delivering as much value as it should or could. Um, and so I think reframing our kind of um, our concept of quality is how this actually is a component of the value that we're creating. And the reason that we're defining this in such a way is because if it hits that, that's where we'll, we will see value um, generated. Yeah, absolutely. And so... In your post as well, you talk about dividing up responsibilities for quality management. And I think this is a fun one because often bigger agencies or organizations will have dedicated QA teams, but often it can actually end up being the PM's job or the dev's job. Uh, And you talk about lobbying for that test engineer role, but in your experience, why is that so important? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, it's a good thing to bring up. Um, and I, I have to say, just, just from a personal background perspective, I, uh, in my early years as a PM, I was doing the QA. And now yeah. having uh, test engineers that I get to collaborate with, it is a, it is, it is a night and day difference. And so I, I think to that end, what, the reason why that role is so important is having to train in critical eye to quality, is, it's so critical. Um, the test engineer, in a way, I think serves as like the best, at least from my perspective, um, PM partner on each project, um, because that role is looking at the details of both what is being built um, and delivered in a way that no other role on the team is. Um, they're focused in the weeds from a technical perspective, but they're also looking at the big picture um, impacts to development and how what we're actually doing is delivered to users. Um, and um, this kind of also helps like when, when you allow a test engineer to actually uh, engage that way, I think they become a, a core member of the team that uh, really multiplies the value of other roles, developer roles and designer roles, um, and certainly my role as well. Yeah, and I think in, in my experience, the the mindset of a test engineer or QA analyst, um, it tends to be very different from a PM. <laughs> as a PM, I always think about, you know, the optimal path 
And when, you know, when I'm testing something, I'll be like, okay, well, this is what you do because I know the, I know the product that's being built. I know how it's supposed to work. And also I have a vested interest in it not being broken because I want it to work and therefore for us to not spend any more time on it. But I think that QA mindset or that test engineer mindset where they have experience in breaking things and uh, thinking about that customer experience and through exploratory testing, finding ways that actually this, um, you know, the ideal path doesn't really work and and how it can break uh, can provide a lot more rigor and thoroughness and and really build and increase the quality of the end product that we're delivering. Uh, Because we know that there's always going to be bugs in what we produce right and i guess this this um leads me on to my next question because in your article you talk about determine your target devices which i think is always super challenging um when often times with our clients you know they might have an old phone or i you know i think back to the days of when people were still working with internet explorer 6 or they had a blackberry and they were expecting everything to work on you know their ancient browsers their ancient phones um so how do you work with your clients to kind of limit when your client wants you know the product that you're building to work on all devices in the past and the future how do you how do you manage that and coach them through that hey guys it's not actually going to work on anything but that's okay so when it comes to uh, determining your target devices, this is actually one of my uh, favorite exercises, um, especially um, with my PM background in mind, because I think it helps um, not only um, narrow in the focus around uh, quality and where the team should invest there, but it also helps um, narrow in the focus of the outcomes that you're trying to create and generate for the users. Um, and the reason for that is, especially when the client maybe wants to have every device ever um, and every operating system ever supported, um, is yeah. it allows you to, to start asking questions about the users that you're actually supporting and what those users actually need. And, you know, we joke about Internet Explorer support um, from back in the day, but, you know, sometimes those those do lead to actual conversations that matter in terms of value for the users um, that maybe it's a really niche app that that is um, that does need that type of support. And so the target devices conversation allows you and your team with the client um, to focus on the user, um, narrow in um, based on priority and the time that it takes to achieve those priorities at a high level, um, what matters and, and what doesn't. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's solid advice. And I think, I think one thing, just a word of caution to uh, people who are writing a statement of work or defining acceptance criteria, just be really wary when you're um, writing what devices you will support um, and and just be careful to clarify and not just say, hey, this will work on all mobile and, um, I don't know, desktop devices uh, for now and forevermore, uh, because what you'll find is not only will it not work on, you know, browsers of the past, but what you'll find is that as browsers evolve, uh, things will also stop working. And so uh, oftentimes it can be the case that, you know, your site or your product might work quite happily. uh, And then Google releases a new version of the browser, and then all of a sudden things break. And whose fault is that? Well, it's worth defining that up front. It's no one's fault, uh, but obviously someone has to pay for the fact of uh, what was working is no longer working. So it is worth determining your target devices and being really clear on those because that is one thing that can really bite you in the butt mm-hmm. if you uh, if you don't define it carefully. So I want to talk about um, test cases. And you know we're now drilling down into... The details, and I'm sure many people have heard of um, test-driven development. Uh, but there's also testing in the moment and documenting as you go. Um, but then we have this kind of conundrum: okay, well, do we have a testing plan? Uh, how do we manage this? So, in your experience, what do you think about test-driven development, and does that generate the right kind of results in terms of generating value? Um, do, do, do your testing engineers? just test in the moment and document as they go? Or do you kind of go with a really kind of thorough testing plan? How do you, how do you work that? Yeah. So, so uh, in my experience at Crema, um, our test engineers um, have led the company in 
so basically the understanding that quality is everyone's job. Um, and so going from that, um, uh, our developers are practitioners of test-driven development, making sure that those integration tests are written into the code um, for the components that make sense so that um, when the actual um, testable functionality gets to a test engineer, um, they have space to be focused more on manual testing from the user's perspective, writing automated tests, um, performing exploratory edge case testing, uh, and more. Yeah. I mean, and you, you talk about, um, you know, everyone being responsible, but obviously the enemy of everyone being responsible is that no one's responsible. So how do you encourage quality um, like as a value in the organization? How do you practically, what does that look like? Yeah. So um, a lot of it is just starts with a foundation of education, having Slack channels where we're talking about it, um, making sure that there's just um, an ongoing discussion around what quality is to, to our projects. Uh, but I, I think from a tactile perspective, um, and especially an area that, that uh, project managers can help out with, is being able to set up processes that allow um, teams to be able to have quality checks throughout. So quality becomes a part of that. Um, so, for example, we use JIRA. Um, and the workflows in there allow us to, if we wanted to set up code review checks, we can enforce those. Um, although I think enforce is a strong word because it's really in, in service of the work. Um, but it allows when when something goes from in progress to um, on, on staging, it goes through a code review. And then when it goes from staging to QA, um, then we have a whole process for that to ensure that it gets the adequate time and coverage that it needs. Yeah, so integrating quality into the process itself, not just thinking, hey, it's about building the component and then it's done, then maybe we QA it. But it's like, hey, part of this being developed is it being tested. Yeah. So I think that's a a strong approach. And you, I mean, you talked about integrating kind of unit testing into your code as you're developing it. Um, and then that kind of begs the question then for me, we have manual testing that will enable us to do that, um, but also automated testing. I mean, how strong is your automated testing and how do you kind of decide when it's worth doing it? Because it obviously takes a long time to set up. Um, how do you kind of balance that in terms of your workflow? Yeah, you know, that, that's a good question. And it leans into it, exactly how um, I approach that. And so manual testing is is, is very valuable. It's, it's low hanging fruit. You can easily dive into that. Um, um, but I think it's particularly valuable um, when compared against automated testing to consider it when the ex user experience is very involved um, or maybe just setting up automated tests wouldn't be the effort. An example of this might be a drag and drop interaction uh, within an app. Um, right. Automated testing, on the other hand, um, can be great when you're doing something over and over again. Um, long, complex information forms are a great example of this. Bonus points if your test engineer can write um, uh, autofill criteria with all those crazy characters that all of our apps are always a fan of. Yeah. And so it sounds like your, your approach for this quality management plan that, you know, that's where we started with this is, Hey, we can get things done right when it's part of our, you know, integrated process as part of the development. Uh, but also when we're thinking perhaps, rather than a one-size-fits-all approach to quality and how we do testing, uh, but that's tailored towards the project, that's tailored even towards the components that you're working on. So how do you kind of, how do you kind of balance that? And it's, it, you know, you're making the quality management process and planning seem and, and kind of sound like, hey, this is actually quite organic, um, it, it it evolves and it changes depending on what scenario you're in. But so how do you kind of get to that point where you're like, Hey, I'm really confident that this is the right approach uh, for this thing that we're building. How does, how does that uh, in that, in the midst of that organic process, how do you define that actually you're, you're, you know, taking the right route? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think you, 
I'm hesitating because um, I am a huge fan of like the organic process. If you think about um, how we yeah. identify velocity over a period of a couple of sprints or so to set us up for success um, throughout the remainder of a project, I kind of look at quality the same way. Uh, when we start a project, we're always going to have that like that first good stab at it. And I think um, kind of uh, the article I wrote about creating a quality management plan outlines a really good framework so you can come up with a really solid foundation of how to approach it. Um, but that's always just an assumption. It's like, you know, especially if that team hasn't worked together before, um, there's going to be things that naturally and organically ebb and flow throughout those first uh, few sprints or few weeks, however you're approaching the project. And I think just being open to saying like, okay, this can ebb and flow a bit, um, not too much. It shouldn't deviate, you know, like dramatically. Um, but uh, maybe, you know, we get into uh, the initial release of the product and we realize that one of our target devices um, is not being used by anyone. And so we need to be able to have the flexibility yeah. to go back and update that target device list so we can have more time and energy around um, other areas. Um, and yeah, so I, I think just kind of really leaning into that that aspect of it is, is so key. Um, and, and then, of course, for me, like the next time I, I start a new project, it's, it's always going to be based off of the experience of the previous project, um, although with empathy of the new team in mind. Yeah, I think common sense plays an enormous part in quality management. And I think often if we're not too careful, we can go down the route of, uh, you know, quality trumps everything. Therefore, we'll create this really solid quality management plan, put these checks and balances in place. But then it becomes something for me, which is a bit like documentation, where we're doing things just for the sake of it, rather than being a bit more organic about it, which is what you're talking about. Um, and somewhere we need to balance this in the middle of, hey, we have checks and balances in place, and we have a plan, but we also need to use our common sense and adapt as we go, uh, which again, it comes back to this agile approach that we're talking about, uh, but not being so kind of blinkered and dogmatic about the the uh, quality management plan that we can't embrace uh, a bit looser, maybe exploratory testing for things and um, adapt as we go to ensure ultimately that we're delivering value and we're delivering value incrementally and ultimately the project or the product that we're working on over time increases in value because uh, and, and as part of, of the quality that we're delivering. Exactly. So we actually recently launched a podcast on our sister site and it's called the QA Lead. So if you're interested in QA and you work with test engineers and QAs, tell them to check out the QALead.com and be sure as a PM to start checking out the post. It is super detailed and it's got a sample and templates that we're sharing through membership. Uh, and through that, if you can use a quality management plan, if you haven't used one before, um, check this out. It's really going to help you think about your process, think about your project or the products that you're working on and how you can deliver more value uh, by delivering a better quality product. So I think these tips have all been so valuable, but I think really what resonated with me uh, was really just this idea of actually this is something that in terms of a, a quality approach, something that we need to cultivate throughout the organization and whether or not we have test engineers or not, um, actually having it part of thinking about quality, not just in terms of does this, is this thing broken or not, but actually this, this also is a reflection on our process and something that we need to think about the entirety of the organization. Are things working? How can we improve them? And having more of that iterative mindset. So thank you, Michael, so much uh, for your insights on this. Thank you. And I wonder what you think. What are your hacks, tips, and tricks for delivering projects or products with quality? Tell us what works and what doesn't work. If you've got any fail stories or wins that you want to share, tell us in the comments below. Uh, and if you want to learn more and get ahead in your work, come and join our tribe with DPM membership. Head to the digitalprojectmanager.com forward slash membership to get access to our Slack team, templates, workshops, office hours, ebooks, and more. And if you like what you heard today, please subscribe and stay in touch on the digitalprojectmanager.com. But until next time, thanks so much for listening.